The uh, chair appreciates the exalted view he is getting of the photographic core, um, but we are going to uh, begin the hearing. This is the semi-annual Humphrey Hawkins hearing. Um, I do want to date, mention before, before the time starts, let me tell the timekeeper, there's one sort of uh, general thing I want to take note of. Um, this is, as people know, the Humphrey Hawkins bill named for its authors, Senators Hubert Humphrey and uh, Gus Hawkins. Uh, a month from today will be Gus Hawkins' 100th birthday. And he couldn't be with us today, but we know he's aware of the, of the hearing. Um, his successor in Congress will be with us, uh, the gentleman from California, Ms. Waters. But uh, we did want to take note of uh, this very significant accomplishment and wish Gus uh, a very happy birthday as we observe his birthday one month in advance with this, uh, with this very important part of his legacy. Now, beginning my statement, um, I want to express my appreciation for the part of the statement that deals with consumer problems. Um, this is a very important step forward. And uh, I want to say that I think there have been some uh, partially inaccurate stories in the press imputing to me and some others some unhappiness with the chairman over uh, uh, consumer, uh, or, uh, consumer inactivity. Um, in fact, I have historically been concerned about the Fed's failure to do that, and particularly their failure to use the authority they've had under the Federal Trade Act to spell out unfair and deceptive practices. But uh, this is something that uh, long predated the chairman and that he is, in fact, addressing. So uh, I do not think it is appropriate for, for people to impute this unhappiness to him. And as I read the report and saw that the last, what, three or four pages of the report uh, were about this consumer issue, it just became very clear to me this is not Uncle Allen's biennial, uh, semi-annual report, and we think we are moving forward on this. I do, however, want to in my statement address the uh, economic issue, the, the macroeconomic issue, obviously the subprime and consumer issues are, are economic. Um, I appreciate the chairman's reemphasis in his opening remarks of the Fed's commitment to the dual mandate, to dealing both with inflation and uh, the need to, to, to restrain inflation and to maximize employment. But Mr. Chairman, we have an honest intellectual difference here. and I. I must say, I think there's a, uh, an, this is an instance of cultural lag. That is, I believe that the single most pressing economic issue facing the country today is the excessive and growing inequality. And I want to read from a report issued under the auspices of Don Evans, President Bush's first Secretary of Commerce and a close friend of the President the head of the Financial Services Forum, a three-member panel that he commissioned, including Grant Aldonis, who was a high-ranking Commerce Department official with trade responsibilities under President Bush, and Matthew Slaughter, an immediate past member of the Council of Economic Advisors. And here is on page 7, and we have copies of this report available, and I think this is essential. This is a report put out by Secretary of Commerce Evans. Two of the three authors were high-ranking economic officials of the Bush administration, this Bush administration. From the mid to late 1970s to the mid late 1990s, the real and relative earnings of less skilled Americans was poor relative to both economy-wide average productivity gains and the earnings of their more skilled counterparts. And since around 2000, the large majority of American workers has seen poor income growth. Only a small share of workers at the very high end has enjoyed strong growth in incomes. The strong U.S. productivity growth of the past several years has not been reflected in broad growth in wage and salary earnings. That's a fact that we need to accept. It's reinforced, uh, and some statistics can be uh, used in other ways, and uh, people sometimes do averages, but I, w I would call people's attention to the footnote on page 6 of the uh, monetary policy report that Chairman Bernanke has submitted. Let me read the footnote. According to the published data, real disposable personal income rose at an annual rate of four and three quarter percent in the first quarter. However, of, of this year, a substantial part of the increase occurred because the Bureau of Economic Analysis added $50 billion at an annual rate 
to its estimate of first quarter wages and salaries in response to information that bonus payments and stock option exercises around the turn of the year were unusually large. Because the BEA did not assume that these payments carried forward into April, real disposable personal income fell sharply in that month. Now the, by the way, the figure that is given by that largely Republican panel on economic growth, which I talked about, is that about 3.8% of the population has seen real growth in income in these past six years, and the rest have not, and some have seen a real erosion. And that includes, by the way, people with college educations. Education does not appear to be the talisman that, that, that uh, dissolves this. Here is our problem. That, the resentment that ge is generated by that is a significant problem in America today. A couple of weeks ago, the immigration bill blew up noisily. Trade promotion authority expired very unnoisily. Not only not with a bank, not even with a whimper. Just went away. In neither case, in my view, were the defeat of those two measures, whether people liked them or not, due to problems and issues intrinsic to those measures. The key factor was the anger on the part of that large percentage of Americans who were not seeing any of the increase in wealth being distributed to them, who say, no, we're not going forward. I think in some cases the anger was displaced at the wrong enemy, but the anger was there. My problem, Mr. Chairman, is that the report and the proposal in some ways will make this worse. Here's where we are. The report and your statement say that you expect us to grow slightly below trend for the rest of this year and next year, trend being 3% of growth, and we're in the 2 plus percent. Uh, I do notice, I must say, semantically, that when we are projected to be somewhat below growth, the answer is near trend. When we're above it, it says above. Um, well, near trend means below trend. At the same time, you predict a, an increase in unemployment. Not a huge one, but up into the four and three quarter range. You know that uh, softness in the labor market is one of the things that will erode real wages. The only time we got real increases in real wages for the large number of people in the population was in the late 90s when unemployment went to 3.9 percent, when we had a very tight labor market. Because we've had an erosion of institutions that help labor in this country, as Peter Temin and Frank Levy have pointed out in their MIT paper, which we have available. So we are really dependent on, on, on a high level of overall growth. You also predict, so you say growth below trend, a slight increase in unemployment, and you expect inflation to moderate, but in frankly an odd phrase you say the real danger is that inflation will fail to moderate as you expect it to. So your lack of confidence in your expectation says that the likeliest thing you want to do is to raise interest rates and slow things down. That is, the, you see the major danger is inflation. Well, if you see the major danger is inflation at a time when inflation appears to be stable and inflation expectations in, 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 in the concept important you appear to be fairly well anchored for the long term, and we appear to be growing at somewhat below trend, not a huge amount, but below trend, and unemployment's going to go up, at best, we're going to continue this problem, and you do note to the credit of, and I appreciate this, that and historically, historically, profits greatly increase, uh, greatly exceed wages. Let me read the exact, and I'm going to give myself an extra minute just to read this. I'll make up for it in my questioning, but there is a specific reference to the fact that given historic trends, there's room for wages to go up and profits still to be in very good shape without it having an inflationary impact. And so with that, with wages having lagged significantly for years, with very, a very small percentage of the population having gotten any real increase in the last five years, with inflation projected to be stable, with growth projected to be below trend by a little bit, unemployment projected to rise even as the labor force drops, which means slower job growth, you say the main concern is inflation. I think that it is cultural lag. I would have understood that better some time ago. But given the social, and, and by the way, I would throw in here the savings rate. People lament the absence of a savings rate. When only 3.8% of the population has gotten any real increase in their wages, in their take-home pay in the last five years, what is it people expect them to save? Canceled stamps? People can't save money if at the end of the month they don't have any, if their wages have not come up. So with all that, 
the conclusion that the main danger facing us now, or the more important one, is inflation, troubles me. Because I think at best, this current situation of increasing inequality with all of its negative social and economic and political consequences stays as is and, and could get worse. And I now recognize the gentleman from Alabama.